How did the kid from your school die? Story 1. There was a boy from a family of alcoholics whose parents divorced. He lived with a mom who was a very heavy drinker and a stepdad. Stepdad had a son who spent quite some time in mental facilities and rehab because he f***ed up his brain with use. The son eventually came home to live with his father and my classmate. One time, the classmate accidentally saw his stepbrother sniffing glue from a bag. Stepbrother got mad, poured kerosene on him, and lit him up. When his mother saw her child was burning, she jumped out the window and ran away while his younger siblings were trying to put out the fire. Unfortunately, once they managed to do it, it was already too late. Story 2. He froze to death in his sleep after passing out in the snow. It was a school trip with his class, and they had some beers, but probably some of the first few times they tried alcohol. It was devastating. They were moving from one house to another, and he had said he needed a break in between, but everyone forgot or just thought he was in another house. It sounds like an obvious mistake, but it's not necessarily that cold even if it's snow, especially after a drink. To lie down and chill on a snow pile with a good jacket is no problem, but if you pass out and forget, well, damn. Whoa, that's such a tragic story. It's heartbreaking to think that a simple mistake during a fun school trip could lead to such a devastating outcome. This should serve as a reminder for everyone to always be mindful of their surroundings and keep an eye on friends, especially when alcohol is involved. Let's learn from this and work towards preventing similar incidents in the future. Story 3. In high school, a girl in the year ahead went missing. There were flyers posted for volunteers to help search for her. It was understood that she wasn't the type to run away. Her mom was out of her mind with worry. A few weeks later, her stepfather was arrested. It seems he abused her and then switched from her to her little sister. She threatened to tell and he murdered her. Then he drove her body out somewhere to dump it, with her little sister in the car. She was too traumatized to remember much. Apparently, he put her body in a dumpster, and it ended up in a landfill somewhere. They got a confession out of the guy by putting him in gen pop and letting the other prisoners know what he was in for. He lasted less than two days. Her name was Debbie Moberg. Reply 1. Well, that's bizarre because a basically identical thing happened to a girl I went to high school with, but her name was Alicia Nicole Bentley. She was 15. She went missing like four days before the school year started. Her city had just been annexed by my city, so her high school was merging with mine, and because the school year hadn't started yet, no one actually knew who she was, but everyone was talking about her. They eventually found her body in a landfill after her stepfather beat and killed her. I remember hearing a rumor that her body was found handcuffed to a headboard that was dumped. But who knows the legitimacy of that? I'll never forget those missing person flyers. I didn't know her, but in the photo they used, she just had this huge smile. She looked so nice. It was so f to what happened to her. Story 4. Of all things, an unfortunate camping accident. This was before cell phones. Two friends went out for the weekend to a campground for some fishing over the weekend. When they didn't arrive home at the time they said they would, the parents called the provincial park to see if they were running a bit late. The weather wasn't great and the camp was about an hour away from town, so it was entirely possible they decided to stay another night and drive out in the morning instead. The park warden stumbled upon their campsite and found both of them dead in their shared tent. Turns out it was a cool night and they decided to run a small heater in the tent to be warm, but it was an old heater that didn't have a shut-off sensor built in. The heater ran all night while they were asleep and since they didn't open the flaps of their tent for air circulation because they wanted to trap the heat, the tent filled with carbon monoxide and suffocated them in their sleep. So sad, and a week before school too. It's crucial to understand how to use equipment properly and ensure proper ventilation when camping. It's a heartbreak loss and my thoughts are with the families affected by this tragedy. May this unfortunate incident serve as a lesson for all of us to prioritize safety and awareness when enjoying the outdoors. Story 5. Playing along a fast-moving creek deep in the woods. The first teen gets pulled under really fast. The second one immediately runs and dives in to find him. A minute later, the first teen comes back up on the other side, exhausted but thankfully unhurt. The guy who went in to find him was not coming back. It was in the days before cell phones. Had to run a good mile back up the trail, hop in the car, drive to the nearby park ranger office, East Texas Big Thicket area, and report slash get help. 
along with guide rescuers. Took about 30 minutes total to get back out there to the accident. Still no sign of him. Rescue workers found that under the higher waters were tons of plants slash tree debris everywhere. After two days of removal, while still trying to control fast-moving waters, his body was finally found. He had dived too deep trying to find the first friend, getting trapped under the submerged branches, without enough energy or breath to fight against the current to get out and back up. He was only 15. Story 6. A violent man, nicknamed the one with the mask during a school camp. We played together three days before. The had a spree over decades in different countries. The craziest part is, a soldier stationed close to the campsite saw the man and my friend in a car during a night run in the woods. Shortly after, the soldier was sent to Iraq. Years later, after he returned, he heard about the case and remembered that night and the car model he saw. This clue led to the arrest, trial, and sentence of a previous suspect. Story 7. Back in school, there were two students that died. The first one drove his father's old car into a river. It was a rainy night and the tires were worn out. By the way, he was too young to drive a car. He had no license. The second one, taking your own life. None of us knew nor suspected, but he had a history of depression and a weird family dynamic. Then his girlfriend broke up with him and that was the end of him. Then in college, there was also a guy who died. His father lost his job, didn't have the guts to tell his family that he lost his job, and got his family in debt without their knowledge. After that, his father still didn't have the guts to tell his family what was going on, so he decided to take his life instead and take his favorite kid, my classmate, with him. It makes no sense to anyone, but the father literally killed his son because he didn't want to die alone when he took his own life. These stories really hit close to home and remind me how fragile life can be. It's so important to be open and honest with those around us, especially when it comes to mental health and tough situations. As a community, we should strive to create a supportive environment where people feel comfortable talking about their struggles. Story 8. The Man Who Hung Himself I was really good friends with him since maybe fifth grade, but I knew him since kindergarten. We weren't talking that much for a bunch of ninth grades, but we really started talking again, and then he died. I was doing multiple school projects with him at the time, but I ended up not having to do them. I was told by my crying mom, and my dad was pretty much crying because of me having to deal with that. There was no clues, nor did he ever say anything about his thoughts. Before that year started, though, his mom told my mom that he's been having bad anxiety and maybe to not talk to him. He was happy to talk anyways. It was a big story and there were people from schools away who knew about it, and the classes I was with him in were pretty much pure sadness and crying. The English class was the worst though. I was crying with my head down on my desk, but the co-teacher in that class comforted me. I worked with her until I graduated last year. God bless her soul. Story 9. Fight with another kid. Got punched in the head, hit the ground, and lights out. I was friends with both of them. Edit. Disregard the previous. I have a shit memory and moved around a lot. Here's what actually happened and the aftermath as a reference in a later article about a similar incident at the same school. In October 1998, a schoolyard shuffle turned deadly when a 14-year-old boy became involved in a fight with 12-year-old Jared Schroeder. Reports at the time indicated the fight began when the older teen, who reportedly had a reputation for disruptive behavior, and had a considerable history of disruptive behavior and significant problems with authority, wanted to play basketball and grabbed a ball from Schroeder, who was playing on one of the school's basketball courts. During the ensuing scuffle, the 14-year-old struck Schroeder on the side of the head, causing the younger boy to fall to the ground unconscious. He later died from injuries sustained in the assault. The suspect in that case was eventually found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Had a similar thing happen at my school, some of the boys were out back behind the school smoking during lunch break. One kid, like grade 7 or 8-ish, was pestering everyone for a smoke before trying to grab one from an older student's hand. Grade 11, 12-ish. The older kid gave him a punch to the head. Not a very hard one, mind you. It was more like roughhousing than an actual attempt at violence. The kid was fine, gave back the ciggy after taking a few puffs. Lunch ended and everyone went back to classes. Then, about an hour or so later, the kid just drops from his seat in the middle of class, not breathing. The teacher performs CPR while another student runs to the office to get them to call an ambulance, but he was dead before they could get there. Story 10. A star football player at my small town school. Parents and faculty idolized him. The whole classic nauseating story. Except for this guy was a giant 
head would purposefully trip overweight girls in P.E. while running laps around the gym during warm-up. He was known to party and gone into more than a few sketchy situations with drunk girls. No girls I knew personally could stand him. He could get away with so much in school just because of his football standing. With that being said, there were a lot of rivers in the area of our town, so it wasn't uncommon to go swimming or jump off low bridges into the water during the warmer months. One late spring, right before summer break, he and his posse of friends were drunk and river swimming. The story I heard is he had dove headfirst off of a bridge into the river, his head hit the bottom and broke his neck. He apparently swam to the river's edge, and when he went to stand up, he slumped over into the water dead. I was told that standing up is what caused his neck to sever his spinal cord, died instantly in front of his friends. Obviously, the town was devastated. They celebrated this kid for a week at school after. I know this will probably sound bad, but he honestly was one of the biggest pricks I ever met. He was cocky and would bully so many people just because he knew he could get away with it. I had seen him make so many young girls cry. So, after his passing, there definitely was an unspoken relief for many kids at that school. The dude was rotten. Story 11. Drinking in a car with three friends, and when the police came, they fled, driving at a high rate of speed. They missed the turn when the road made a T. There was a massive tree directly behind the double arrow sign, and they wrapped the car around it. To make the situation worse, the police arrived and refused help to the screaming teens until after they interrogated them. Three of the boys died, and the fourth was in a body cast for six months and in rehabilitation for years with permanent disabilities. The parents sued the police for not helping the boys and allowing them to bleed out. The parents won and the disabled boy has enough money to cover his care for the remainder of his life. The boys did break the law and were stupid, but for the police to tell them that they are going to allow them to die if they don't answer their questions, and then they died was inexcusable on any level, and they should have been charged, not just fired. This story is both heartbreaking and infuriating. While the actions of these young men were reckless, the response from the police was completely unacceptable. No one deserves to suffer due to a lack of empathy and compassion from those who are meant to protect and serve. It's a relief to hear that some justice was served for the families, but it's a stark reminder that we must continue to advocate for responsible and compassionate law enforcement. My thoughts go out to the families and the survivor who has to live with the consequences of that tragic night. Story 12. In high school, I had a friend that had a troubled family life. He was living with foster parents and ran away back to his family on the reserve. They were First Nations, Cree specifically. He got picked up by our equivalent of CPS and was transported back to his foster family's house in town. While on the highway, he jumped out of the car while it was traveling at a low speed. He got hit by another car on the oncoming lane going circa 100 kilometers per hour. Looking back on it 20 years later, it is still painful. He was such a good boy. It breaks my heart to think of how much he missed his family and was willing to risk his life to go back to them, despite the abuse and use. He just didn't feel like he belonged in his foster family's house. They were decent people, just not his family. There was another kid I went to school with, but barely knew. She had a few disabilities and health issues. She passed from some kind of heart condition. Story 13. A few days after coming out to his family, he came into school and gave a few of us things of his, like a new Xbox controller he'd gotten for Christmas or some old WWE stuff. None of us knew at the time this was a bad sign. He just said he wanted to show us how thankful he was for us, and since he was moving for college, he wasn't taking a lot of it with him. Several days after graduation, he drove his truck out to the field we used to drink and party at, and shot himself. The other kid was killed in a motorcycle accident. Several died from ODs before we graduated. One is on death row for the execution of a cop and two are elderly people. So he'll be dead in a few months. Small town America is f***ed up. I graduated with less than a hundred kids. Around 50% of us are either dead, in jail, or adult to extreme addiction. It's scary to think I easily could have been one of those people if I just made a couple of different choices. The saddest part is, so far, I'm the only kid that was out as gay in high school and hasn't either themselves yet. Luckily, we were a bit younger than the crowd who got sent to die out east. Everyone that joined from my year didn't even see a deployment before their four or eight from the gate was up. I can't imagine what it was like graduating in 2002. Just about everyone that could around were joined up. Most of them didn't come home. Story 14. 
In grade 8, Dad left him home to watch his younger sisters when he went to grab milk from the store. Short trip, the boy was a little neurodivergent, so found his dad's gun to act as a protector, and on his lap sitting on the couch. According to his sister, he accidentally dropped the gun off his lap and picked it up with the barrel facing him, and it just went off. She was too young to know what to do, and he bled out. He was a guy that was truly liked by everyone. He was a little bit different, but just a cool guy to everyone and had a big heart. We are all in our 40s now, and his closest friends were hit so hard that they still call each other nightly from different cities just to check in. Story 15. I had a few people. But the one I wasn't particularly attached to, as in we weren't friends and didn't know each other too well, was a guy who had just graduated. I knew Jack throughout our study hall that year. We didn't talk much and didn't have much in common, but he seemed like an alright guy. He was known to be a respectable and decent person outside of school, and he got very popular because he was always throwing parties or attending them. About a week after graduation, Jack and another graduate, we'll call him Steve, were going to a lot of parties to celebrate. They were very close and spent a lot of time together and would frequently go to these sorts of things together. One night, they decided to go across the bay to a party and drove there with the intention to get hammered and grabbing a ride home because they didn't want to drive wasted. Later on, the duo decides to borrow a canoe from the person hosting the party and begin to paddle out over the bay in the middle of the night without any lights or vests. Jack and Steve make most of the trip, but when approaching the shoreline, things get a little rough. They are drunk, and when coming in, the canoe gets imbalanced, then tips, Jack falls in, and Steve does too. Steve begins swimming away from the canoe and gets on land, but Jack never made it. The police think that because it was so dark, Jack couldn't find his way to the shoreline, and because the water was kinda rough for a canoe, he was probably tired from rowing up until it tipped. Later, it came out that Steve just went home when he made it to shore. Steve never phoned the police. When police began their investigation, they wondered why a kid would row out on a canoe by himself and were trying to find more details. Steve's parents told the police that Steve was with Jack the night he died. Steve was charged with leaving the scene of a fatal boating accident that led to the death of his friend, but had the second charge dropped which was the reckless operation of a boating vessel. Steve and Jack were friends for 10 years before Jack died. Steve moved out of town and no one ever spoke to him again. Please leave your story down below in the comments. I would absolutely love to make a video about them in the future. And also, don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, peace.